Good morning, everyone. Thanks again for tuning in to Crosspoint Online. Today we have David Best coming in to um, preach to us from Romans chapter 12. But before that, we'll just share communion together. If you need a moment to go and prepare the elements, then feel free to press pause and go and grab something. Some of you may know Craig Shepherd. Craig passed away recently after a, a long battle with various health issues. Craig was well known, well liked and highly respected for his faith in Jesus despite all his suffering. Craig's wife Jane has been sharing some memories and some reflections about Craig's life on Facebook. One thing Jane wrote was that she said when she first met Craig she was intrigued by his necklace. It was four rugged nails fashioned into the shape of a cross. It was an unusual accessory and somewhat confronting to look at. Jane described how she noticed that Craig would squeeze his cross, squeeze the necklace, as he reflected and meditated during the Lord's Supper. And sometimes he would even wipe away quiet tears. Jane could see how much this sacrament, this process meant to Craig. Craig said that he wore that cross as a reminder of the enormity of the sacrifice that Jesus made for him. Craig was always conscious of the fact that God's grace God's forgiveness is not a reward for our goodness. In fact, it's the opposite. Jesus had to suffer because of our actions. We all experience some pain and suffering in this life. Craig maybe had even more than his share. Some people blame God for the suffering and the pain. Some people even deny that there is a God because of suffering and pain. But Craig always recognised that pain and suffering are part of this life. In fact, he would say, why should Christ suffer? and not me. So Jesus did choose to suffer for our benefit. People caused the problem, but Jesus is the solution to the problem. We can choose to acknowledge our need for a saviour, a redeemer, a deliverer, or we can deny Jesus and choose to pay our own price for our own sins. The Bible says the wages but the consequences of sin is death. So this is serious business and serious consideration is needed. Remember last week when we talked about the wealthy young man from Matthew chapter 19? Jesus made it clear that eternity is more important than this life. And if God calls us to make a sacrifice in this life, we will have treasure in heaven. But that young man decided that the thing, things of this world were more important to him. And we all have a similar choice. Do we put our faith in Jesus, who leads us to eternal life, or do we put our faith in the things of this world? The Bible describes how Jesus instigated the practice of communion. And the night before his death, Jesus sh shared a meal with his disciples. And in Matthew 26, we read that while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And Jesus said, take and eat, this is my body. And Jesus often used metaphors at other times in his life. He also said, I am the door or I am the bread or I am the vine. These are all analogies that make perfect sense in the context of what Jesus was talking about at the time. And now the Last Supper, this was a Passover meal where they remembered that a lamb had died and the blood of the lamb had been used to set them free, to rescue them from death and from slavery. Jesus had already been described as the lamb of God. Now that his death is close, Jesus initiates this ceremony as a way for us to remember. Someone had to die for the sins of people. Some people choose to die for their own sins, but that is not necessary. For those of us who believe in Jesus, death is no longer necessary. Jesus has died in our place. He has become the substitute for us. His death paid our debt. He died so that we could live. That is what we remember. That is what we celebrate when we share communion together. So I invite you now in your own time to prepare your heart. I ask you to give thanks to God. Acknowledge to God your own failures and your own need of forgiveness. 
confess to God who is faithful to forgive. And then when you're ready, take the bread or the biscuit or whatever you have and eat. And remember Jesus who died in our place. Then Jesus also took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said to them, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This drink represents the blood of Jesus. And Leviticus 17 tells us that it is the blood that makes atonement. So the blood of Jesus was spilt for our benefit, for our forgiveness, for our atonement. This literally represents the fact that we can be forgiven. We don't have to die for our, our own sin because Jesus did, has done that for us. That is great news. That is incredible news. That is almost too good to be true news, but it is true. For those of us who do believe in Jesus, we do not have to die in the spiritual sense. We can have eternal life. I invite you all to drink together again, acknowledging and thanking Jesus for what he has done. Let's all pray together. Oh, Father God, we just want to say thank you so much. We are overwhelmed by your love and your faithfulness and your forgiveness. Thank you for Jesus, for his death and his sacrifice that pays for our debt. We could never pay it ourselves. So thank you for paying our price. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the gift of life. In life on this earth, we can experience your goodness, your faithfulness, your peace, despite the pain and the suffering that we all face. And thank you most of all for the promise of life after this, eternity with you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, David Best is going to preach for us today from Romans chapter 12. So I'm just going to read that chapter for you now, and then I'll hand over to David. Romans chapter 12. The heading in my Bible is A Living Sacrifice. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If your gift is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. And do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. 
And do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now David is going to come and bring the message from that chapter. Thank you. Well, good morning, Cross Pointers. We thought we'd be beating together, but we're here meeting as we are, have, we have done and have done for the last few weeks, and we trust this morning will be a blessed time together. Let's just pray together. Our Father, this morning we will come into your presence. And Father, we pray that you just quiet in our hearts, wherever we may be listening, we'll listen to what you have to say. Bless this time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the reading this morning from Romans chapter 12, from verse uh, 1 to 21, I just want to take the first part of that uh, chapter. And particularly I want to think about around the first part of that uh, verse, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You know, it's interesting to note in the background of the book of Romans, this, this point that John MacArthur writes in his commentary the following, most if not all of the great revivals and reformations in history of the church have been directly related to the book of Romans. In September AD 386, a native of North Africa who was a professor for several years in Milan, Italy, sat weeping in a garden of a friend's home, contemplating just his weak, wicked life. And he heard a child singing in the background these words, take up and read, take up and read. And there laying before him was a, the scroll of the book of Romans. It was beside him, he picked it up and read. And that moment he was converted to a great, and their great revival began. About a thousand years later, Martin Luther was teaching this book to the students. And as he studied, he became more and more convinced by the theme of justification by faith alone. So began the great Reform Reformation. Several centuries later, John Wesley studied the book. And we know what happened then. There was a great revival. So this book of Romans in many questions and answers are answered concerning God. And the Apostle Paul was so, to, so devoted to Jesus Christ that he would rebuke and he would scold and he would plead with the Romans to come to Christ. He expressed to them the nature of God, of the Gospel, its relation to the Old Testament Jewish law and its transforming power. And this transforming power that would transform lives, he wanted them to know more of. The story is told of a man that seemed beyond redemption. His crimes included eight, kill, eight shootings and killing six people. He had started a nearly 1,500 fires that terrorised the city of New York in the 70s. He even left a, a letter at his crime scenes taunting the police that they couldn't catch him but he was finally apprehended and given a consecutive sentence of 25 years to life for each of the murder. Yet God reached down to this man and God transformed this man and he treated life and today he's a believer in Jesus Christ. He now spends his time daily in the scripture as he expresses deep regret to his victim's family and, and continues to pray for them. Although in prison now for over four decades, this man who's seen beyond redemption finds hope in God and he claims, my freedom is found in one word, Jesus. This is the transforming power of the good news of Jesus Christ. This is also Paul's burning desire to see the Roman people come to know Christ, to know the real peace, and to know real freedom for Jesus Christ. Now notice in chapter 10, Paul was saying to them that his heart's desire for them was to be saved. And then in chapter 11, 
he asks this question, has God cast his people away? And he answers it, certainly not. And then he comes to this great verse in chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You see here, the basis of Paul's exhortation is on God's mercy. And these mercies here include many gracious blessings. Perhaps the most two important mercies of God are that of his love and his grace. Yet these mercies of God are reflected in his power of salvation and the great kindness towards those he saves. His mercy then brings us forgiveness for our sins. We have reconciliation with him. We are justified before him. We are in conformity with his son in his very presence. There is a resurrection in our, in our bodies. We receive divine sonship. The Holy Spirit personally indwells and intercedes for us. We have received faith. We have received peace. We have received hope. We even share in his glories and in his honour. These are the mercies of God. And God's compassion has been described in detail in the first 11 chapters of Romans. And now Paul applies it here to them personally. And he says, I beseech you. And on the basis of all that God has done, Paul urges believers to open themselves to the transforming, transformation of the power of the gospel rather than to conform in the world's way. Look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. He shows them that the practice of righteousness requires intimate ties to the new faith community. God has created a new thing, a living body for them. And this beseech that Paul talks about, this beseech then is asking someone urgently and passionately to do something about what is being said to them. Then he's noticed what he says. He says, by the mercies of God. And the word mercy here involves compassion and to yield to it. Remember these mercies which Paul ta talked about. We are justified, including pardon, removal of sin from ourselves and being made righteous with God. Being made just as we've never sinned. We are identified. We have a new identity and we are taken out of the old Adam by the death of Christ on the cross. We are dead to sin and to the law and now alive to Christ. We are now under grace and not under law. There is no condemnation. We have freedom from law and sin. We are now witnesses of the sonship and heirship. We now have help in infirmities and in the present sufferings on the way to, the, to being with him. We have divine election, our final conformity to Christ's image in which believers already are glorified in God's sight. There is now a coming glory far beyond any comprehension with present sufferings. We have no separation from God God now loves us in Christ. We now have a conf confidence in God's faithfulness. And this is confirmed by his revealing plans to the nation of Israel. And all these are free. They're free to us when we ask Jesus Christ to come into our lives. So then is it any wonder that Paul, Paul says, I beseech you, that he begs them, that he pleads with them to put their faith in God and not miss out. Then he says to them these words, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which your spiritual service. Now notice he says that you present your bodies. This is an image taken from the bringing the sacrifices to the altar. It is now to be to, <laughs> let's start again. Notice what he says. 
that, your present, uh, that you present your bodies. And this is an image taken from bringing sacrifices to the altar. It is now to, to God himself. And the person bringing this offering picked out the best. He picked out the choice of his flock and he brought it to the altar and he presented it there as atonement for his sin. There they were to be wholly the Lord's property, as the whole burnt offering was, no part being devoured by any other use. And that is how God wants us to come to him, totally not holding back. Not saying, I'll wait a little longer. Not saying, I'll wait till I'm married. Not saying, I'll wait till I have enough money saved up. And not saying, wait till I retire. You see, it is a total thing with God. There is no holding back, no holding part back. But just as you are right now, you come to him. Now, in the case of a slave, his master owns his body. So he does as what his master says. Often, he would lack inner peace or inner enthusiasm to do that. But we are besought to present our bodies, that is, willingly to do so. You see, God who made us owns us. And in our believing view of God's mercy then, we find our hearts going out. For there is a great drawing power in the knowledge that someone has loved us and has given us such a divine bounties as these mercies that we talked about. Then we read, that our sacrifice is to be to God, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. This is in contrast to those slain offerings Israel brought to God in the Old Testament. A sacrifice is an offering made to God as a punishment for sin or any other offering made to him and his service as an expression of thankfulness of worship. It implies that he who offers it presents it entirely. He releases all claim or right to it and he leaves it to be disposed of at, to the honour of God. And it is to be holy. It is to be without spot. It is to be without imperfection. Referring still to the sacrifice required by law. It is to be set apart for a special purpose. Only the giving of ourselves and the giving of ourselves totally is acceptable to God. Then notice he said acceptable to God. The sacrifice being perfect in its kind and being such that both can be acceptable and well-pleasing to God who searches the heart. All these phrases are sacrificial. And they show, they show there must be a complete surrender of the person, the body, the whole man, mind and flesh. All to be given to God and that he is to consider himself no more his own, but the entire property of his master. And then we read, which is your spiritual sacrifice? We are to present to God our hearts and our minds. All that we are, all that we have. It does not require great talent. It doesn't require great skill or leadership abilities. But it does require our hearts and minds to be focused on him, on him. The only sacrifice of service, of worship, that pleases God is a sincere, loving, thoughtful heart, full devotion and praise to his children. You know, some, some years ago I worked for an international broad, Christian broadcaster and they had a, a massive lot of stations in the Philippines and the man that directed that was named Fred McBumwa. And Fred and I travelled across Australia and in the Philippines together and he shared with me one day that he was preaching on this on the radio and they put it on tape. And he said, as I put it into the machine to be, to be played over air, he said, I went outside and I noticed at the top of the 300-foot tower, 
the light had gone out that, ga that um, is required to be there by the, air, uh, in, by the aviation authorities. So he said, I grounded that tower, or I thought I grounded that tower, and I climbed that tower. And he says, as I got near the top of that tower, suddenly the, the transmission coming out of that tower grabbed me because I haven't grounded the thing properly. And he said, through my body, I could hear myself speaking. And he said, I was speaking these words, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And as he hung there, he didn't know what to do. And he just said, God, your will be done. You see, Fred had come from a witch doctor family. And Fred had been grown up as an engineer. And Fred had worked with FEBC for a long time. And he had come to that place where he said financially they couldn't stay any longer. And they had come to that place where they had just made their mind up that they were moving on. And this was going to be his last broadcast. And as he hung there, hung there he committed his life to God as never before. And he said, suddenly something happened and I fell. And as I fell, I caught my leg in one of the rungs of the ladder and stopped me from falling straight to the ground and dying. He said, I managed to call over to the nurse's home and talk to her. You know, Fred was to go on to serve God all the rest of his life. He was known right round the world and many thousands of people had come to Christ and many hundreds of thousands probably of young people were thrust into the mission field as a result of his commitment to Jesus Christ. Just imagine what your life would be like if you gave to Christ. Dr John MacArthur tells this story. He says, During a conference in which I was preaching on a different difference between true and false believers, a man came to me with tears running down his cheeks and said, I believe I'm a sham Christian. I replied, let me ask you something. What is the deepest desire of your heart? What weighs heaviest on your heart? What occupies your mind and thoughts more than anything else? And his answer was this. My greatest desire is to give all that I have and am and have to Jesus Christ. And he, I replied, that's not the desire of a sham Christian. That's the spirit-prompted desire of a redeemed soul to be a living sacrifice. So we are asked, and Paul pleads with us, to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And I want to say to you folk this morning, as we do this, we'll come through this pandemic and we'll go out to be a bigger witness for Jesus Christ than this world has ever known before. It's because we've come and we've presented ourselves wholly under him. Maybe sometime in the future we'll look at the second verse and maybe some of the other chapter, but we'll leave that where it is this morning. Let's just pray. Father, we want to pray that your Holy Spirit will work through our hearts and minds as we think through these words. We want to ask, Lord, that in a very real way you will challenge people that we will be committed totally to you and we will be a service for you, whatever that requires. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.